Well, it is um, very exciting. It's a real pleasure to be hosting Rob Jagir this evening. Uh, uh, Professor Jagir uh, is at, the, at, at UMass Dartmouth in the Department of Biology. He received his PhD from Western University in Canada and was a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Toronto and in the Department of Neurobiology at UMass Medical School. His research integrates concepts and methodologies from evolutionary ecology, psychology, neurobiology, molecular biology, and computer science, a range of fields, uh, to gain insight into plant pollinator systems. In 2018, he was given the Regional Impact Award by the Native Plant Trust for his Becology Citizen Science Project, which you'll hear more about tonight. Um, and that project aims to accelerate biodiversity conservation efforts, specifically in New England. Rob, it is so wonderful to have you here. I turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk about a little bit about how I'm using citizen science to improve uh, biodiversity conservation efforts in um, New England. Uh, by citizen science, you know, we'll use that using this term generally, uh, referring to individuals, from individuals to garden clubs, to um, conservation groups and, um, and towns. And by biodiversity, so biodiversity means a lot of different things, so a lot of different people. Um, here I'm referring to uh, species interaction, so diversity of species interactions, and, and particularly those interactions um, that involve uh, animal pollinated plants. So my talk's divided up into three parts, and um, I'm going to start by talking, I call it Pollination Biology 101, but it's more to give a background to help you to understand the system. Now, I am certain that, you know, when I say the term pollinator, everybody knows or thinks they know what I'm talking about. But, you know, given quite a few of these talks and talked to a lot of people, and it seems that the, the term pollinator is, is being misused to the point where I feel it's starting to have a negative effect on the things we're trying to save. Um, and so there's a big difference between flower visitor and pollinator, um, but for whatever reason, people think that they're the same thing. So I'm going to spend quite a bit of time talking about the difference, why it's important, and what it really, what pollinator really means, and why I choose to use the term pollination system. I don't have necessarily have a problem with the term pollinator, but pollination system forces you to think about what's important, and so you know I, I use that or, or plant pollinator system uh, instead. So once we get a sense of of the background, I'm then gonna talk about goals. And I think a lot of what's going on with, with pollinators and, and quote unquote pollinator conservation, um, you know, I have a very specific goal. Uh, and, and I think that because I have such a specific goal, it's really helped people to, to get together to, to, um, you know, to, to really move things forward because we, we have a clear sense of where we wanna go. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about, about, about the goals and then how I've used those, those goals to, to establish partnerships to help uh, address the problem, uh, which I'll also talk about. And then I'll end with what we're actually in the past two years, um, we've been able to take a lot of the data that I've collected and that the um, citizen scientists through my ecology um, project, which I'll talk about, have collected. And we're able to take those data and turn them into conservation strategies, right? Where we're actually putting plants in the ground and I expected it to have a positive effect, but not so quickly. And, and so I'm going to end with quite a few success stories. And I'm hoping that I'll be, be able to generate some momentum so that many of you will want to, um, you know, help me to, to move things forward, become ecologists. Um, and again, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a bit. So starting off with what is a pollinator? If we were doing this talk in person, I would probably ask you, tell me what your definition of pollinator is. Um, but here, I just want to make the, the I want to differentiate the, the pollinator from a flower visitor. So there are a wide variety of animals that visit flowers to feed on the nectar, pollen, or both. Uh, globally, there are about 200,000 of these species or so. The vast majority of those species are insects. So of the 200,000, only about um, 1,000 or so are vertebrates, like our hummingbird here. Um, and so what we see on our flowers, for the most part, are insects. And these insects include bees and um, you know, moss and butterflies and flies, wasps and, and, and beetles. Um, 
and so what the, the typical environment that these animals encounter, you can see in the background, we, if you go to any old field or roadside, you'll see a lot of different things in bloom at the same time. And all of these individuals, if they're, if they're looking for nectar, are competing with one another to try to find nectar sources and try to, 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 to figure out which of these plants um, are good sources of nectar uh, and or pollen. So you know, a lot of, they're confronted with a lot of different things and they need to decide which ones um, should they visit. Now there's this notion out there that they're simply, you know, when we look back at what they, what they have, that they're simply using color and they have these innate programs. So if we put out white flowers, we're gonna attract butterflies. If we put out blue flowers, we're gonna attract bees. And, and, and the, the reality of the situation is only a small percentage of animals have these innate preferences and the vast majority of, of uh, things that are visiting flowers, these flower visitors are, are um, using uh, learning and memory to figure out which ones are offering the, the greatest reward. So they'll go out and they'll sample and they'll learn the characteristics of the ones that have a lot of reward. And the way that we can test this very simply in the lab, uh, here we have our monarch butterfly and using what's called the proboscis extension reflex. So you touch the, the legs of the butterfly with a cotton swab soaked with sucrose solution and it sticks out its tongue and starts feeding on the sucrose solution, similar to Pavlov and his, his dogs. We then show a stimulus, it could be a color, could be a shape, could be an odor, introduce an odor for a few seconds. And then we um, touch the, the legs with the cotton swab and get the tongue to, uh, and then they start to feed. Now, if there was an innate response to yellow, we would see that the butterfly sticking out its tongue to look for food reward. If we present it with an odor, uh, a naive individual, and they're showing a response initially, that would suggest that there is some sort of a preference. Um, so we do the pairing um, with the yellow, and then we show it other colors during the testing phase. We see blue, there's no change in the proboscis or the the antenna. Here we show a color that's similar to the training color, um, still no response. And then we show the, the, the uh, color that it's trained to. And very quickly, our butterfly sticks out its tongue looking for reward, drops its antenna. Um, and so, you know, this, this occurs after a couple of pairings. This butterfly can remember that, that yellow is rewarding for up to over a month uh, for, for a migrant that's well within its lifespan. Um, we can reverse, we could make blue the rewarding color and it will no longer respond to um, yellow. And so, you know, this shows us that, that most of what's going on is learning and in this case, um, associative learning. Now, if, if our butterflies, as they're, you know, or our bees or whatever, our flower visitors are moving from flower to flower and, and if and only if in the process they're transferring pollen, between flowers leading to fertilization and seed set, then and only then can we change their name from a flower visitor to a pollinator. And so the term pollinator is, has nothing really to do with the animal, it has to do with the plant. And this is what's being missed by pretty much everybody is that the term pollinator absolutely goes along with what that animal's doing with respect to plant reproduction. So, you know, the majority of, of, of plants are flowering plants and, and most of those um, require um, an animal to, to transfer their male gametes, the, the pollen to the surface of the stigma where it, um, we get, um, so, so the pollen's transferred and then we get fertilization that's leading to the production of seeds and fruit. And this process, right, from start to finish is, is, is referred to as pollination. So it's, a, it's an ecological process. Now, I could give a, an hour long talk on plant mating systems. So some plants are, they can, they can um, um, produce seeds and fruit right, with their own pollen. So if we have uh, an individual that is moving up this inflorescence of, of uh, this um, lobelia, um, if it's what's called self-compatible, that means it can receive its own pollen leading to fertilization and seed set. There are many plants that are what's called self-incompatible. So even though the animal may be moving pollen from flower to flower up this plant, there's absolutely no pollination taking place because it's, it's self-incompatible. Now, we could then have animals moving pollen from one plant to another plant. And again, if this leads to fertilization and production of seeds and fruit, it's being pollinated. So we could call that animal a pollinator. 
Um, and this, this process of transferring pollen to a, an individual that's, that's unrelated is called outcrossing. Now we could also substitute this, this plant with one of another species and we're still getting pollen transferred but, and we're getting pollen, deposi dis pollen deposition on the, the surface of the stigma, but we're not getting any pollination taking place. So in terms of pollinator and the functional importance of pollination as an ecological process, it is absolutely critical that we know what that animal is doing with respect to plant reproduction. So to put this into perspective, give you an example, here is Obedient plant, we have two bumblebee species that historically were present in Massachusetts in good numbers. Bombus fervidus is on the right and Bombus affinus is, is, is down here. Bombus fervidus is entering the flower making contact with the male and female reproductive organs and in doing so um, leading to fertilization and production of seeds and fruit. Therefore, we can call our Bombus fervidus a pollinator. Here, we've got Bombus affinus. Bombus affinus is not going into the flower. In fact, it's biting a hole at the base of the flower because it's a nectar robber. And it is robbing pollen from this um, obedient plant, sorry, robbing nectar and not making any contact with male and female reproductive organs. Therefore, our Bombus affinus is not a pollinator. In fact, our Bombus affinus is a parasite, right? It is taking things from the plant and benefiting and not giving the plant anything in return. In fact, what our Bombus affinus is doing by taking the nectar is deterring the pollinator, Bombus fervidus, because Bombus fervidus is going to go into the flower and there isn't going to be any nectar left because. Bombus affinus has taken it. And so we're going to call our Bombus affinus a flower visitor until we introduce the plant that it actually pollinates. And what's interesting about this is that Bombus affinus is nine, Bombus tricola, which is a sister species, is they're not very good pollinators of tubular flowers because they're programmed to go and bite holes at the base to rob nectar. That's how they get their competitive advantage. Remember, the animals are looking and competing to get that nectar, which is a limited resource. And so we're not gonna change our name. And the other interesting thing about Bombus affinus is it's the poster child for pollinator decline. It's on the endangered species list, yet it's not a very good pollinator of, 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 of tubular flowers. And so I could have thousands and thousands of Bombus affinus on my obedient plant and there's no pollination going on. So we wouldn't call it a pollinator. And we can't give our, even though we, Bombus affinus could act as a pollinator until we introduce the plant that it actually pollinates and it actually pollinates that plant, we're not gonna call it a pollinator. So you can't call something a pollinator and just hope it's gonna pollinate some point in the future. You have to know that the plants that are depending on that animal for pollination are actually present. Similarly, I could invent, if I could invent a feeder that would feed all the bees on the planet, we would still be in the same situation that we are. Why? Because what's important is not the number of bees that we have, it's how much pollination is going on. And we're gonna see why that's important. And this is what, for whatever reason is missed. This idea that we need to feed the bees, feed the animals, feed the butterflies, and let's forget about pollination, but that's the pollination that we're trying to protect because of its ecological importance, which we'll get to in a minute. If we look at another example, here we have the pineland golden trumpet. Here are all of the things that we're gonna see on our pineland golden trumpet, You know, more than a dozen species. Only three of them, are pollinators. So I, if I remove the three circled in green from the system, I would have um, uh, three, six, nine species um, visiting. So tons of diversity, but no pollination going on. They're all flower visitors. Similarly, I could remove the nine and just have the three or one of the three, and I would have that pollination going on. So it's very important that we understand things from the plant's perspective. And hopefully you can see that the term pollinator Absolutely, you have to think about the animal and plant together as, as a unit. Now, when we look at uh, plant pollinator dynamics, so we're going into the field where we have uh, a lot more complexity, right? If we go into our meadow, we have multiple things in bloom. And if we look at our individual animals on this side that are, that are going out and trying to find and maximize their net rate of, of nectar intake or pollen intake, because that, that ability is going to transfer into their um, reproductive success, and that's eventually going to feed into the populations of these different species. If we have our bat pollinator, for example, and it decides to go from the purple flower to the purple flower all the way through, from the plant's perspective, this is an ideal pollinator, right? It's picking up pollen from one plant, moving to another unrelated plant of the same species, depositing the pollen, picking up more as it's moving through. Let's say our bat decides that I, specializing isn't the best strategy, they go from purple to this pink one to yellow, back to purple to red. 
from the plant's perspective, this is a bad pollinator. There may be some pollination going on, but what's happening is that if you are the purple flowered plant species, you're effectively wasting your male gametes on another species, right? Because it's not leading to fertilization of um, production of seeds and fruit. And from the pink flowered plant species perspective, receiving heterospecific pollen, so pollen from another species, what it does is it blocks the surface of the stigma and prevents it from receiving its own pollen. So there's a major cost, both in the terms of male and female reproduction, um, to uh, animals that decide to switch back and forth between different species rather than specializing. Now, the good news is that the reason that we have, and this is the whole other side of my research, which I don't have talk, time to talk about today, but the reason that we have so much floral display diversity is because that's the way that the plants force the animals to specialize, right? And so when we introduce pesticides and things, the, the animals start to make bad decisions and they start to transfer more pollen and there's a cost from the plant side and also from the animal side. And so we have, um, that, that what the plants are doing is jamming the sensory and cognitive systems of those animals, making them think that it's in their best interest to specialize when really, um, uh, be, because when they switch, there's a cost and, and I don't wanna to go too much into it. Um, but how they decide to visit flowers has a direct effect on seed and fruit production and then our plant population size. So there's a lot going on. So then, we, we I've, hopefully you have a sense of what we mean by pollinator and flower visitors. So then what exactly, when, and this terms, these terms are used all the time, pollinator friendly plants, uh, a pollinator plant or pollinator habitat. What exactly does this mean? And in, in my opinion, it's really meaningless because people are using flower visitor when they really should mean pollinator. And in fact, if you put any animal pollinated plant, anything that has nectar and pollen out in in the, the field that like you planted, something is gonna use it for nectar and pollen. So any animal pollinated plant is, is, is pollinator friendly. And so the term really, you know, we're just gonna introduce animal pollinated plants. The point that I wanna make here using hummingbirds as an example, is that this important, the importance of including plant in our definition of pollinator and thinking of those two together. So let's say we've got our hummingbirds, we've got our hummingbird feeders, which we love, we can feed tons of hummingbirds. The hummingbirds are happy, one-stop shopping, reduce predation risk. There's some competition, but not too bad versus visiting native plants like the lobelia here, monarda and jewelweed. If you're a hummingbird, <clears throat> are you gonna visit hundreds of flowers to get the same amount you could get one-stop shopping on this side? No, so you're gonna start to move and you're gonna feed from the feeder, right? In doing so though, the plant doesn't get pollinated. So if I'm feeding my animals, is, is that pollinator friendly? When the things that I, I'm trying to pollinate aren't getting pollinated, the answer is no. So it's far better from the sense if you wanna really help pollinators, you're helping the process of pollination, you need to be putting in the native plants that the animals are actually pollinating. And we're gonna see why this is important. Similarly, I talk about native plants because our native plants and our animals have co-evolved together. I could put in a, a European honeysuckle, a non-native plant, and I could be feeding the birds and keeping them quite happy. But what's by doing this, I am reducing pollination services to my native plants, which is going to have cascading negative effects, ecologically speaking. And so here I'm doing effectively the same thing. I'm feeding animals one species versus helping this system which is at least two species, and then things that use those animal pollinated plants, the positive effects amplify. And that's why, again, we, we need to change the, the, the terms that we use or at least get proper definitions when we're talking about pollinators and pollinator habitats and exactly what are we trying to do. Um, so that's why I, decide, I decided that it would be better to, to use the term pollination system. And so a pollination system, it has there are a few definitions. The one I use is that an, a plant and all of its pollinators to collectively is called a pollination system. And that way you're forced to think about the native plant that's involved in the system. And you're not just thinking about the bee, for example. And so if we look at these, these systems, right, they're about, I, I mentioned before, there are 200,000 um, flower visiting uh, plant species that act as a pollinator, some capacity, 300 uh, animal pollinated plant species worldwide, give or take. Now there isn't a single animal on this side that can pollinate everything on this side, and there's a single plant on this side that can feed everything on this side. And what we see are these subsets. There are plants are pollinated by a subset of these animals, and these animals are uh, visiting a subset of these plants for food. 
and they've co-evolved together so that there's a really good fit between the two. And that's what I mean by pollination system. So just some examples of these systems. Here's a bumblebee pollinated plant. You notice that the pollen is on the thorax or the back of the bumblebee. Why? Because it's very difficult for that bee to groom it off. You can think of, you know, when you have an itch in the middle of your back, it's really hard to get to. The plant's doing that because it's trying to maximize pollen transfer efficiency, right? The bee's trying to take the pollen and eat it. The plant needs the pollen for reproduction. And so it's, it's positioning its pollen in a way to maximize that transfer of pollen and minimize how much the bee's actually taking. Here's another example of a hummingbird pollinated plant. Notice that the pollen is being deposited on the forehead of the hummingbird. Why? Because if the plant deposited on the wings of a hummingbird, it wouldn't be a very efficient system. The female, the stigma, the female reproductive parts here. So as the bird's moving in, the nectar is located at the base of the flower. As the bird moves in, it's rubbing its forehead against the female part, transferring pollen, then picking up pollen as it feeds. And then when it moves to another plant, it can transfer that pollen. Here's a fly pollinated system. And this is a highly specialized system, meaning that there's one fly species that's the pollinator, and then there's the plant species that is the only species that this, this fly feeds on. And it's tongue, which goes to about here in the slide. Hopefully you can see my mouse, uh, my pointer. Um, and the two, the nectar is located way at the base of this tube. So these two, if you lose the fly, you lose the plant. And if you lose the plant, you use the fly, lose the fly. Um, some of these other systems are more generalized. So yes, bumblebees are the most efficient pollinators, but there may be some other animals that act as a pollinator, but not to the extent that a bumblebee would. Um, here's a butterfly system. Notice the pollen on the proboscis or the tongue of the monarch butterfly. Now, we think that red flowers have to, are, are meant to attract hummingbirds. Well, actually what's going on is that the plant, not only is it trying to get its most effective pollinator, in this case of hummingbird, it's trying to deter less effective pollinators. So there's a push and pull that's going on from the plant's perspective. So our bumblebee could easily crawl into this flower, long tongue bumblebee and get the nectar located at the base of the tube. But if it does so, it's not making contact with male and female reproductive parts. So it's that parasite that's, that's going in and taking something and deterring our hummingbirds. And so the color red is the way that the plants, as well as the orientation of the flower, is the way that the plant deters bumblebees from visiting because the bumblebees can't process combinations of, of red and, and other visual cues effectively. So they decide to go to other plant species, leaving the nectar for the hummingbirds, which is the most efficient pollinator. So there's a lot, a lot going on when it comes to plants and it isn't about attracting, a lot of it is, is about deterring. So why are these systems and why is pollination in general important? Again, I'm sure you're all familiar with this side of the equation and that is agriculture, right? Numbers thrown around, one out of every three bites of food we take comes from a, a pollinator. Well, guess what? It does, they do, it does come from a pollinator, though those numbers are true. But in terms of how many species are contributing to the pollination of crop plants, it's only about 5% of the native species. So we have 4,000 native bee species in North America and 5% of which, and that's a generous number, are actually important pollinators. Why? Because they don't have the numbers that uh, you need to pollinate something like, uh, excuse me, something like this, acres and acres of one thing. And that's the only thing in bloom for a couple of weeks. To do that job, you need a lot. And so that's why we've brought in non-native honeybees to do the job. And they're excellent, ideal, for crop pollination like this. Large areas, seas of one thing, they're in one of these boxes, there are 30,000 individuals, and extremely important in terms of crop pollination and agriculture, the honeybee. We have a handful of native species. Here's our bumblebee, bombus and patients, good for buzz pollination. We've got some other native bees. Again, only a handful that we're using to do the majority of our crop pollination. So we've got a handful of species, natives, pollinating, Non-native species may have been native, have native ancestors, but we've selectively bred them so that they're very far, like quite a bit removed from their native ancestors. And they, this is feeding one species and that's us. And we could throw in domesticated animals if you want. So a handful of species. So we've got these artificial systems, these artificial pollination systems that are very focused. When we switch to looking at the other side of the equation, the other place that pollination is important, the ecological side, things change considerably. Agriculturally speaking, what's important is abundance. We just need to flood the system and get that pollination done. Diversity does not matter. Here, diversity absolutely matters. And the reason for that is because these pollination systems, the diversity of pollination systems that we have, they're providing food, shelter, and nest sites for small mammals, for birds. And so you can think of those 
the, the, the hundreds and, and hundreds of native plants, animal pollinated plants, the different seeds that they're producing, the, the cover, the shelter, the nest sites that those, that those plants provide for things like our small mammals and our birds. And then those small mammals and birds are eaten by predatory species. And so these systems, the diversity of the systems, you could think of them as the foundation and we're generating diversity and ecological function with, with these pollination systems as our foundation. And, and so as we start to erode these systems, we're gonna eventually start to affect the food supply at this level and it's gonna affect the food supply at this level. And eventually we're going to get what's called ecosystem collapse. We're not gonna be able to support the diversity any longer because our foundation has been eroded. And that's the danger. And, and you know, I mentioned that the honeybee is extremely important from an agricultural side. The honeybee plays absolutely no role whatsoever, ecologically speaking. We could wipe it, remove it from North America altogether and it would have no impact. In fact, I would argue that it would have a slightly positive impact when we're looking at ecological function and pollination. Uh, that's because there are, there are no native honeybee pollinated plants because they're, they're non-native and, and we have limited resource nectar and pollen. And so they can be looked at as competitors in that, from that perspective. So you may argue, well, um, and so just to give you an example, one of many examples that I could give you, this is a native rose, Carolina, Virginia rose. It is, um, feeding, so it's used as a source of pollen for all of the bumblebee species and many other bee species in decline. If in addition, that our plant is being used as a host plant by the apple sphinx moth, and these the larval stage is food for, for many uh, birds. The adult phase, the moth phase, may be food for our eastern whippoorwill, which is a species at risk, and the pollination products, right, the rose hips, are, are food for all these species. So we are, the, our system then, Everything that we get in terms of the production of seeds and fruit and plant material, that's who we're feeding. It's all of that wildlife that is depending on those native plants. Um, and so, you know, things really scale up. Now, why is this important from our perspective? You know, people will say, well, you know, agriculture, we, it's our, our well-being. We need food. It's, there's a you know, billion dollar year industry, a lot of jobs. But ecologically speaking, who cares? So what? We lose a few species. Well, um, you know, healthy, diverse ecosystems provide us with what are called ecosystem services. These are things we get from nature for free. Carbon sequestration, decomposition, water purification, all of these come from healthy ecosystems. And if we start to erode our ecosystems and our foundation, we're going to lose these services like as what's, what's happened in China, where they're now hand pollinating all of their crop plants or they're using drones to release bubbles with pollen. And they just don't have any of this diversity because um, things have collapsed. And, and if we could figure out a way to inv invent something to replace these services, it's going to have a significant price tag. And I think in many cases, we won't be able to replace them. And once these connections are gone, they're gone and, and that's it. So, so there's, you know, we have definitely should have more interest than we do in keeping this diversity going. So what's the problem then? And again, you're familiar with pollinator decline, bee decline, you know, uh, came to the public's attention in 2006 with the colony collapse disorder. Uh, people like me that have been studying bumblebees for a while and, and, and plant pollinator systems knew that Bombus avens, for example, was in decline in the late 90s. And we were telling people we need to do something and nobody would listen. And then 2006 with honeybees, because, you know, the agriculture, it brought attention to the problem, which is great. And, and, um, and so anyway, I'm going to focus on the, the wild pollination, so the ecological side of pollination and looking at things, we're seeing this degradation both from the animal side and the plant side. So here are some data from Massachusetts. Um, so based on museum specimens, here is what was around, um, where are we here? We are um, Borealis, we're at high elevation. So this is for uh, above a thousand feet. Pre 2000s of blue, and I went back to the same sites and collect and did intensive surveys from 2015 to 2019. Well, actually, up to present, but here are data from to 2019. And you'll notice that um, there are uh, the yellow bars are lower than the blue bars. There's a there's a decline. Bombus affinis. Uh, you don't see any yellow bars because it's likely locally extinct. Although I, I still um, have hope that there is a small population uh, around. Um, but we can see Bombus tricola. Bombus vegans, all significant declines. And if we look at butterflies, we see the same thing. 
Many species are in decline in New England and not surprised enough, I, I could have, I didn't have enough space, but I could have put on non-bumblebee bees. There's similar declines there. And then not surprisingly, a lot of our, our native plants are in decline. And a lot of these native plants in decline, guess what, are pollinated by the, the bumblebee species in decline, for example. So it's very clear that there are species both from the plant, these systems are in decline. But what I wanna point out here is that not everything is in decline. And people have this notion that if they have a plant that's got a bunch of bees buzzing on it, that they're helping because everything's in trouble. So if I just get something, then I'm, I'm helping. And that is absolutely not the case. So if we look at bumblebees, the yellow bars in many cases for Bombus impatiens and Bombus chrysiaculus, some species are headed in the direction of local extinction. Impatiens has exploded over the same time period and expanded its range. The same thing is happening in butterflies. The same thing is happening in other bees. And the same thing is happening in native plants. And so what we have is are what are called differential declines. Some things are up, some things are down. And, and so if we, if we decide to, to save the bees in this general way, we're not necessarily helping the things that need the help. And, and this is, I started to realize this, that, that people were, there was this one size fits all approach. And I know based on my field experience with, with bumblebees and other you know, butterflies and other, other bees, that, that that's not the case, that, that you can't, you know, as I, as I said, one plant can't feed everything, that there are these, these systems that we need to pay attention to. And so, you know, the other thing is that there is a, a big difference, and I'm noticing this more recently, that people are equating a specialist bee with a bee in trouble, or a specialist butterfly with a butterfly in trouble, and confusing specialists with rare species with declining species. So to give you an example, here we have um, the goldenrod cellophane bee. It's a goldenrod specialist, right? Goldenrod is not going anywhere anytime soon. And so in terms of floral resources, this bee is perfectly fine as a specialist. There's, there's no threat. The populations are stable to increasing over time. Bomba sanderson eye is a rare bumblebee species. Historically, it's rare, and presently it's rare if we look across the state. There are some areas where you know, it's, it's fairly abundant and other areas where you don't see it, like these little pockets. We then look to Bombus tricola. Bombus tricola in the 80s was everywhere from the Cape to you know, Pittsfield across the state. And now I only find it in small pockets in Western Massachusetts. So this species is clearly in decline. This species is rare, but stable. And this species is a specialist, but, but not um, declining at all, would be stable, potentially increasing. And, and, and so if we, our goal is conservation, we should be focusing on things that actually need help, not things that don't need help and those species that are stable. Um, we should focus our attention on the ones that are gonna become locally extinct because once they're gone, we're not gonna get them back, all right? So, um, so what is it then that's causing the problem, these declines that we're seeing there? You know, my lab's focused on all these things. We're studying all these things. I've looked at you know, pesticides, climate change, disease. Um, you know, if neonicotinoids very clearly are not a good thing for flower visiting insects and many other insects. Um, and uh, both lethal and sublethal effects. And we look at all those herbicides aren't, aren't great for native plants. Um, and disease certainly is an issue. Are there new pathogens coming over, spilling over from honeybees or possibly increased levels of, of natural pathogens? Uh, climate change puts plants and pollinators out of sync. We saw a lot of that this year where we have warm springs. Some plant species bloom based on temperature, some bloom based on day length, and the same with the animals emerging. And if, if you have a warm spring, they come, the animals may come out and things may not be in bloom for a month and they don't have anything to eat. So we're getting a mismatch. Um, habitat change and loss and exotic species are the other two. And, you know, obviously the threat is going to depend on where you are. So pesticides are a huge issue in urban areas and agricultural areas, right? In conservation land, and, and by the way, we saw these declines before the pesticides became widespread. So, you know, the habitat change and loss and exotic species, I think across the board, people would agree that these are the major drivers of decline. And certainly pesticides and disease and climate change aren't helping the situation at all. They are accelerating declines in areas where your urban and agricultural areas, for example, with the, with the pesticides. So I'm going to focus and I focus my efforts down here to figure out, you know, how are we changing habitat? What do we need to do to change habitat to, to stop these declines? 
how are exotic species playing a role? Uh, pesticides, you know, don't use pesticides. I mean, it's the take home there. It's a pretty straightforward message. And, you know, in the case of disease, if, if you know, to minimize transmission from potential transmission from honeybees to native bees, you want to keep honeybees on agricultural land and keep them off of conservation land, for example. Um, so if we look at ha habitat change, then that's the goal, right? So we want to know how is it that we're affecting habitat to drive these declines and what do we need to do to change the habitat to stop the declines to help these systems, both from the animal side of the equation and the plant side of the equation? How is it that we should change these things? And so um, to answer this question, the first thing we need to understand uh, um, is that we need to focus, as I mentioned, on the species that actually need it. And all species um, need different things at different times of their life cycle, right? Different points of their life cycle. So if you're a butterfly, there's, you need host plants, right? And you also need nectar plants as the adult stage. So there are two things that you would need to support butterfly population. In bees, you need, um, so at this time of the year, they're all hibernating. So you need to find proper hibernation sites. Then when they come out in the spring, you need to find, uh, they need to find proper nest sites right, suitable nest sites, and then they need nectar and pollen. The pollen is their source of protein. That's how they make new bees. The nectar is their fuel, if you will. So bees can live, bumblebees can live a couple of months on nectar alone, but they can't make any new bees until you start to give them pollen. Um, and this, this difference between nectar and pollen is going to become important in a little bit. Um, at the end of their cycle, they mate, and then they need to find that overwintering um, spot. So we need three things um, in the case of bees or four things. And so my research then was, was, you know, I'm trying to figure out what do these species at risk need? Now, the other thing that we need to understand is that these species differences, right? That species need things at different times and their life cycles are all different. And let's just look at timing of the life cycle, right? So if we're gonna, if we're thinking about how we're gonna change habitat, let's say we're thinking about what we're gonna put in in terms of floral resources, Obviously, we want the animals to be present that we're trying to help when the floral resources are present. And, and so if we look at some butterfly species that are um, considered at risk, you can see here are the flight times. You can see that species differ and when they are um, active. And so if we're going to plant something that blooms in September, let's say we want to load up on goldenrods and asters in September and October, um, some of these species, you're, you're going to miss them right? You're going to miss the target species, the ones you're trying to help. You'll certainly get a lot of butterflies, but they're not going to be, they're going to be common species and not species at risk. A great example is this, is this bee, um, this Adrena bee, uh, Carlini. Uh, you probably can't see this, but this is June, right? So this is the middle of May. This species has done its life cycle before June 1st. And so if we're planting and we have tons of things that start in June and July, and we think that we're helping, and this is a very pollinator friendly habitat, we've completely missed the species. It's gonna come out and not have any food, and it's not gonna be able to persist. Our bumblebee species, so our Bombus fervidus, that's, that's a species at risk, comes out in the spring and sticks around until late August. And so we need, and things are only blooming, so this is showing you the bloom time for different plant species. You can see that we need to think about a consecutive bloom to give this bee enough nectar, enough fuel, and also enough pollen to, to complete its life cycle. So we absolutely need to pay attention to when these things are active, when we start to think about strategies. Um, and so to give you an example, you know, willow, and I, I go on and on about willow because in the spring, if you wanna help the pollinators, then you better start putting in more spring plants, um, in particular willow. So willow, um, and there are multiple species of native willow, um, is if you put in a male that has nectar and pollen, it's helping all the threatened bee species that are considered at risk. There are queens coming out or there are males and females coming out that need the nectar and pollen to persist. In addition, all of these butterflies are around looking for nectar early in the spring. And this butterfly species at risk uses it as a host plant. So just by planting willow and focusing on the spring, you're helping all of these species that um, are, are at risk. If we decide to mow our willow, which happens very often as we you know, try to control invasives, we just mow everything and, and mow down the willow, you're removing a, a very important resource for these species at risk and likely that's going to have an effect on their, their population. Okay, so the next thing then is we wanna 
you have to understand, again, because we have these differential declines, you cannot talk about this is a good bumblebee plant because as we'll see, each species is different. And so we need to figure out, or you need to learn how to identify which species are the ones in need and which ones are common. And to give you an example, here are two species that are in trouble, Fervidus and, and Bombus tricola. Bombus and Patience, you'll see this bee in the thousands, literally in the thousands, in late August and through September until the first hard frost. And I go into areas and I'll do bumblebee surveys and see 2,000 Bombus and Patience, and, and there should be three or four other species present at that time in that, at that location. And so people see tons of bumblebee activity and again, think it's a great bee plant, but they're missing the ones that need it. So we need to know what's visiting our plants. And this goes for the butterfly species in decline as well. Um, you wanna know whether you have the ones that are in need and if not, when you make a change to your, um, to your garden or to your conservation land that it's actually having a positive impact. And a lot of what I'm doing is teaching people how to tell these things apart so that you know that you're making a difference and you also know you understand what strategy you would need to uh, develop in order to, to, um, to help these species. And, uh, and so, you know, I give bumblebee identification workshops and plant pollinator interactions, pollination biology type workshops through the summer. And if you're interested, you know, shoot me an email and, and uh, I will likely be able to find some time. I don't have a lot of time to go into it now, but just know that here are the species that historically were present in Massachusetts, the social species, I don't have the parasites here, parasitic species. Um, all right, so, so going into this in around 2015, as was mentioned, I was working on monarch butterflies at UMass Medical and my advisor said, you can't even say the word bumblebee or bee in the lab. It's all monarchs all the time. So in 2015, I got out and you know wanted to, to, to look at the, the the declines that we were seeing and, and get back into the plant pollinator um, pollination biology. And, um, and so I started to see these plant lists that were being put out by pollinator.org, Xerces, all these pollinator, quote unquote, pollinator conservation groups. And I started to notice something that was rather disturbing given my experience in the area. And that is that, and this is a, a list from pollinator.org that I pulled off the web. The first thing is that bumblebees are treated as one thing. Right? And I know full well that they differ in tongue length and you can't treat them as one thing. The other thing that I noticed is that a lot of the plants that were being recommended are non-native plants. And so if you're trying to restore pollination systems and the functional role of, of bumblebees in ecosystems as pollinators, you shouldn't be putting native plants in. Um, and then looking at the species that were considered at risk, a lot of these plants didn't even, they didn't even visit. Um, and so, you know, looking at all the bees, mixes that that are around you know uh, wildflower mixes that are going to help pollinators this is what we see right we see a lot of the same thing a lot of cultivars a lot of non-native species and they're all composites uh, and i know that the species in trouble have long tongues so so this started to, to bother me there i know that they're using certain plants for pollen certain plants for nectar or i had a sense that they did and, and that, that there's no separation of these two things um and the reason that this is important is because if we look at, you know, here we have goldenrod and we have a medium to short tongue bee, bombus and patience. And, you know, these bees just, they land on the flower and they poke around. The nectar is easily accessible, right? So anything with a short to medium tongue can get nectar. If we look at our jewelweed flower over here, the nectar is located at the base of the spur. The bee has to crawl inside the flower and it needs the tongue length to get to the base of the spur to get the nectar. So here's bombus fervus with a long tongue that's able to do that. Our short tongue bees, assuming they're not robbing the flower, can't get the nectar. And so they don't visit our jewelweed. But similarly, our long tongue bees don't visit goldenrod. Our bombus fervidus, you won't see on goldenrod. Why? Because its tongue gets in the way and it can't compete with short to medium tongue species, which you know, if you've seen a goldenrod in the fall, it's covered with different things. And so if we decide to load up on these plants, we're completely missing the, plant, the, the species that actually need it with a long tongue. So just by understanding tongue length differences, that should help to inform your plant selection. But, um, and so, you know, knowing or having a good sense that these bees at risk were using things other than what everybody was recommending to plant, I decided to go out in 2015 and start collecting data. 
And so my study sites, I had three high elevation sites in orange or four high elevation sites that I've used since 2015, four low elevation sites. Typically it's, this is my, um, my first site at the Breakneck Hill in Southboro, it's about 40 acres. Create transects, walk up and down transects once a week um, from May, late May through October and just survey all the bumblebee flower interactions that I see. So looking at the species, male, female, worker, is it collecting nectar, pollen, that type of thing. Now, I couldn't be everywhere. I started to notice interesting patterns with my data and I couldn't go, I couldn't get everywhere that I needed to, to collect the data I needed to move things forward quickly. And so what I did was I decided to ask um, people that were interested in conservation to participate in the project. And I, I developed the Ecology Citizen Science Project. So the initial goal of the project was to get people to help me to collect these ecological data. So data on bumblebee plant, the bumblebee flower interactions and send them to me so that I could crowdsource data collection to get a sense of what these species at risk actually prefer in terms of, of, of nectar and pollen sources. So that was phase one. Now, since that time, I have added two goals and we're already through goal three and I'm getting ready to add a new goal. And we're expanding out to, um, to butterflies. We've teamed up with iNaturalist now um, to help with the data collection through the uh, web app, uh, which you can get on becology.wpi.edu. So we're now able to collect data on butterflies, other bees, anything that iNaturalist can, can ID can now be incorporated into our database. And what separates what, what I'm trying to do with what everybody else is trying to do is I'm not concerned just with the bee, right? Where the bees are, where the butterflies are. I'm absolutely interested in what those bees are doing because that's what's important. The bees are telling me, the butterflies are telling me what they want to eat and I'm just giving them what they need. Pretty straightforward. Um, and, and so the, the data goes into the database and then we have a bunch of online tools, um, you know, that developing curriculum and a bunch of other things. Um, but focus more on the research, the data collection side, looking at what I found through, and, and my graduate students uh, found uh, was quite interesting and, and not really surprising that based on tongue length, so here are our bumblebee species down here, the ones in red, circled in red are the ones of uh, conservation concern that short tongue bees were visiting things that matched up with their short tongue, right? Medium bees generally, and then the long tongue bees were doing things like prunella, vetch, and red clover that had long tubes, right? So th those patterns help. But what was interesting, and this is, this is for one site in July, but as I said, I have multiple sites, and what's interesting is these patterns held across sites. Um, and they change a little bit depending on plant species composition, and I'll talk a bit about that in a minute, but generally the patterns held. Um, but you'll notice that vegans really like prunella. These bees were all in the same place. By the way, there are about 25 plant species in bloom where I saw a bumblebee visiting. But out of those 25 species, each bumblebee species made most of the observations were just on one or two species. Over 50% of the observations were on one species. In fact, in perplexus in July, all of the observations were on milkweed. And so um, so that was the first thing is that clearly these bees are not generalists, meaning that they just indiscriminately visit anything that they can get their tongue length on, their, their tongues on. Um, and, and within tongue length categories, vegans preferred prunella over red clover um, and, and, and liked vetch as well. Our impatiens loves white clover, loves, um, but the other two species with a similar body size and tongue length were doing other things. Um, no impatiens were observed on milkweed, common milkweed but the other species of the same tongue lengths seemed to like it. So there were these, there was this variation. And, and so the other thing that I noticed was that when I went into areas and surveyed where there were a lot of native plants, so, you know, vetch and red clover I mentioned are at this site and other sites were the main nectar and pollen sources for Bombus vegans and Bombus fervus, which are two species in decline. But when I went to areas where there were natives, Monarda, Penstemon in combination and Prunella, what I saw was that the numbers of vegans and fervidus were pretty much double, if not more, than what I was seeing on vetch and red clover. So although they like vetch and red clover, when we have these native species, which they match up with in the system, they tend to do better. So this, these were very interesting findings. Now, when we look at the Becology data, here are all the Becology data since 2015. So, you know, we've got, I don't know, three, 4,000 observations at this point here, are all the, the species that, that we had are, are color coded. And um, so looking at these data, looking in July, right, same time frame, 
same species, Fervidus and Vagans, and, and also Tericola, we're seeing the same pattern. Tericola was observed on milkweed, right? Fervidus is observed on vetch and red clover. Vagans is on self heal, red clover, and vetch. And so what this says then is that even though I'm doing re really controlled surveys, that citizen science data is, is producing the same result. So that's helping me to, to and very much help me, and I appreciate all the, the work of the ecologists helped me to get data to, to figure out what these species actually need in terms of nectar plants. Now, what was also interesting is pollen plants. So bees actively collecting pollen from flowers. There was only at the same site, there were, even though they were collecting nectar from a bunch of different things, all species were collecting pollen from just one species, in this case, meadowsweet. And I noticed that there are certain key plants that they use for pollen. Others they use for nectar and get pollen as a byproduct. And when you have everything competing for the same resource, you're going to get winners and losers. And this is, you know, suggests that then the amount of pollen, the quality of pollen as a limiting resource, you're going to get ecological winners and losers. And when you have high numbers of uh, one species, they definitely could outcompete or you know get all the pollen before those species at risk. They're in lower numbers. So there's stronger competition for pollen than there is for nectar. Now, all of these data were put together into this plant list. So, so my partnerships with the, the citizen scientists and different groups collect, helping me to collect data helped to generate this plant list, um, which you can get on my website, jagirlab.weebly.com. The plant, this plant list is 100% data driven. New data comes in, the plant list changes, simple as that. Um, and, and so based on the data that I've collected, and I've collected a lot of it, like my own research, probably 10 to 20,000 observations at this point across the state. Um, so I'm pretty confident in the, 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 the plants that I put on the list. And just to give you an example of how things need to look to be able to support these species, you know, going from spring to fall, this is just a, a couple of suggestions. In the spring, we've got wood betony and, and, and lupin moving into the two penstemons, Hirsutus and, and Digitalis into Monarda to Prunella and then finishing with the jewelweed for the longer tongue. And then in terms of pollen, the willow, Carolina and Virginia rose, St. John's work could be in here, Meadowsweet, they're, they're all on the list. But this is just an example of what we would need to put in in order to support these species at risk. And flipping things over, these species, their main pollinators are long tongue bees. And I have a grad student that's looking at how effective these bees are relative to, to shorter tongue species. Um, she's doing that for her um, graduate work. So, so the second goal then is to teach people how to assess the quality of habitat. Um, and so what do we do? We go into an area and you need to figure out where are we at with respect to the species at risk and where do we need to go? And so there are two things that, that I've been doing. One is um, removing um, non-native plants. Right. So you go out and you do a survey. So this is Breakneck Hill. You figure out what's there, what native plants are there. You flag it. You make sure you don't mow it. Um, in this site, so 40 acres is a bunch of, um, you know, golden raw, a bunch of things in bloom all throughout the 40 acres. Down here, it's all purple loosestrife. So doing surveys, purple loosestrife, honeybees and bombus and patients, the common eastern bumblebee in the thousands. What I didn't see any of, bombus vegans and bombus fervus. They were on the, the few vetch and red clover plants that were scattered throughout the 40 acres, right? So decided to remove the purple loosestrife. And after just three years, after removing the loosestrife, this is one plant, that's Bombus vegans. And back here we have Bombus fervidus. Now I haven't, you know, I sometimes don't see any Bombus fervidus at this site for the entire season. And just by removing that loosestrife and putting in a plant that they want, which is on my list, this monkey flower, the numbers of it just they they were just drawn to the site and multiple fervidus and vegans and and on the same plant was unheard of at the site. In addition, all these other natives came up. So it may not be that you need to put anything in. You may just need to to remove some invasives and just removing some of the invasives can have a really positive effect. The other thing is when we think about we want to limit the non-native flower visitors and this is bringing in the honeybee, which again. Honeybee plays an important role in agriculture, but here's what ecological effect it may have. Here we have a site in Lincoln, Massachusetts. Um, this is a Monarda, fistulosa, fistulosa, Monarda fistulosa variety rubra, um, so wild bergamot. Here are some survey data. 
So um, the last week of July, um, and then in, in the light gray is the first week of August. So we're just, we're a week apart, right? So we go in, I survey tons of fervidus and vagans all over the Monarda rubra. And there were also um, a, a few carpenter bees. Now the carpenter bees like our aphnis and our tricola bite holes and steal nectar. And so what happened was that this opened up the resource for honeybees. And the next week when I surveyed, there were, and this is one survey period, there were uh, between 100 and 150 honeybees on those plants. It was a sea of honeybees. And guess who wasn't there? No fervidus and no red uh, uh, and no vagans. They had been pushed off of the resource to vetch and red clover. Um, and so this is a trend that I see a lot. To, again, mountain mint and uh, is not a very, is, is not good for the species at risk, but certainly there's a lot of activity. Um, but if you look at how many honeybees there are relative to native things, native wasps and native uh, the common bumblebee, it's, it's like a 10 to one ratio. Same with goldenrod, lots of activity, 10 to one ratio, no, no native species when you have that high number, but again, because the nectar is a limiting resource. So again, abundance and diversity, and also do we have native abundance or non-native abundance and how might that be affecting competition and what effects might it be having on our species at risk? We need to think about these things. All right, so the last thing then um, that I wanna finish with is we've got our, our plants that we, we think might work. Uh, we know what we want to do. Um, you know, we know what we have on our, our, our land. The, the third goal then is taking the data and actually putting the plants in the ground. And last year, you know, COVID is, you know, I'd rather be with you in person. <laughs> um, but one of the good things to come out of COVID is people had a lot of time on their hands and they wanted to get outside. And so um, this you know, there were a lot of volunteers that were out putting the plants from my list in the ground as, as plugs and, and shrubs. And, um, and doing so allowed those plants to bloom last year. And then those that didn't bloom last year bloom this year. And I was shocked at the positive effect that this had on those species at risk. So here is my Dartmouth habitat, not that big. Here's the, the, um, and I know, um, you know, Freddie's not happy with this, this photo, but I think it, it gives you a sense of the size. So a small plot back here is all of the land that I surveyed, right? The loose strife was over here. Um, and so put in those plants and plugs. And as soon as those plants started blooming, guess who showed up? So everything along the bottom is a picture. Here's Bombus vegans on meadow sweet collecting pollen in Dartmouth. Here is purple giant hyssop and a Bombus fervidus at Dartmouth. This is a Bombus vegans on Prunella, um, a, a Fervidus on Monarda in, in Southborough, Monkey Flower in Southborough, and a Steeple Bush, uh, Bombus Fervidus collecting pollen in, in Southborough. So, uh, year two, things that didn't bloom, same thing. So here's Showy Goldenrod. Here is a Bombus uh, vegans queen. Here is a Penstem and Hirsutus, which is, you know, this plant in terms of being uh, attractive to these species at risk, it's like a magnet. I've got this at several sites and every one of them has Bombus fervidus and Bombus vegans. And this thing, these, this plant blooms for, uh, um, you know, a couple of weeks. Uh, the bags are, I have a student that I mentioned doing pollination experiments. So we're looking at the effectiveness of, of here's Bombus fervidus down here as um, a pollinator of, of these plants. So this is a species at risk. So we're looking to see if how we might be able to help plant species at risk by understanding pollination. And finally, um, it's, as I said, it's, it's not just about the, um, you know, it's not just about the, the, um, the nectar and pollen, it's about the products, right? So here we have a white-throated sparrow that this was taken last week, I believe, um, in Southborough. This is on a shrubby St. John's wort that we put in and um, it's feeding on the seeds and this bird, likes the, um, you know, needs to forage on the ground, needs cover close by, and is a seed-eating bird. And um, also a lot of dark-eyed juncos were observed. So we're seeing the connections. And this is where I'm moving the project next, is who's using the plants that are being pollinated by these species at risk? So we can try to understand those ecological connections that are extremely important. 
The other thing that we're starting to do is to, to understand nesting habit habitat. So here, uh, again, because of COVID, they didn't mow. Um, so this is an area that they didn't mow. And um, Bombus fervidus uh, likes to nest in tall grass, likely in abandoned road nests. And so by not mowing, we found a Bombus fervidus nest, which are extremely hard to find. I told them not to mow this year. And guess what? Another Bombus fervidus nest over here that you can't see in the tall grass. So you don't have to leave a lot unmowed. You could do selective mowing. You're providing the nesting habitat that you need to get your Bombus fervidus going. Um, pithy stems, important for a lot of the stem nesting bees. Now you can't cut your, your stems to the ground. You have to, and you have to leave them for a couple of years for them to be um, effective. Also, you know, uh, we have ground nesting bees that like certain soils and th this varies depending on the species. So we need a lot more research to understand nesting at the species level and, and sort of move away from this, this one size fits all approach. Um, but certainly with fervidus, just by because of COVID, we were able to get a good sense and all of the nests for Bombus fervidus look the same. And what happens is that they're likely using abandoned road nests. And when you mow, what happens is that the rodents go underground and the fervidus are not going to use those um, nests as a nest site. The fervidus bumblebees don't dig their own nests. Um, when you don't mow, they do surface nests and the, the fervidus then can use those surface nests. So that's another problem with, with mowing. You have to think about when to mow and how much you're mowing. Um, and, and again, we really need to understand natural history and ecology. It's not about taxonomy, where the bees are, what the bees look like. It's absolutely about what they're doing. And I, I, I think that what I'm doing really hammers that point home. And I'm very excited about where things are going in terms of conservation. Community participation has, has been incredible. We're having winter soil events, seed, seed exchanges, people are putting these plants. You know, the key for me is for people to see the effects. And a lot of the volunteers last year saw these species at risk visiting the plants that they worked so hard to put in. And what did they do? They started to put those plants in themselves and are starting to see these species in their backyards. And it's really helping this, um, this project and, and my research and, and, and the conservation efforts to, to grow and, and improve uh, over time. So with that, I would like to thank you very much for your time. And I am happy to take any messages or messages. Happy to take any questions. I'll take messages too, I guess, if you, if you want. But thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. That was uh, such a clear and, and great and very informative talk. And I know we have a number of questions already. Um, many of them, I think about planting advice. I think mm -hmm. one that I, I saw, um, and I also I do want to note that it's it's eight oh five, um, and I, I do want to respect um, your time, Dr. Jagir. So oh no, I went I went over, so that's my fault. Okay. <laughs> and you know I'd cut out a lot of slides too because I always cram everything in and go over time. So <laughs> gonna have to cut out a few more for the next talk. So it's very hard. Um, yeah. Someone was basically asking, you know, it's it that it's hard to sort of. In, intuitively understand it. it, we may never completely understand all of these interdependencies. And so is the best advice to plant, you know, a variety of things that flower all season? Um, how, how do you kind of, how do you go about planting? Right. Like, yeah. Right. So, so again, it depends on your goal. So anytime you want to plant a native plant, you're, you're benefiting something. If we want to bring in the term pollinator, then we want to focus on the species that need it. There is no sense making common species more common because all you're doing is giving them a competitive advantage. So we need to focus on the species that need it. And that's what my research does. So every plant on my list is going to help the species that need it. I've included data on, and you know, I've got a grad student collecting data for butterflies to get to the species level and target species at risk and, and other bees. You know, I talked to um, someone from, from Tufts Pollinator Initiative um, to, to start to, to bring in the other bees that are easy to ID. And, and so it's far better to pick some plants from my list that I know are going to help the species that need it than just randomly plant things that bloom consecutively because all you're doing is, is more often than not, you're helping species that don't need any help. They, they, you're, and you're, the cost is that you're hurting the species that actually need it. So putting in things, and I, I look at these seed mixes at this everywhere, the state level, I just looked at a new Xerces list, putting in mountain mint, putting in echinacea, putting in black eyed Susan is not helping the species that need it. They may look great to us, but they're not, and, and just looking at common species, they're not supporting the diversity that you think they would, given how much attention they're getting. Um, so I, I don't agree with the just 
consecutive bloom. We need to target things. And, and yes, it may take a, you know, if you look at my list, um, the information is there. So I've made things, things easy. And, and now I'm getting data and things that I put in just to support, support the list even more. But I think that that's a better strategy. And just to clarify, I mean, if you plant those, um, if you plant those plants that sort of target the at-risk species, the others will come too. Oh right? yes, sorry, yeah. yes. So <laughs> I am not, I am not trying to make common species less common. Um, those common species will visit every one of the species on that list, but but the species at risk won't visit everything that's on your traditional pollinator plant list. And bum, even bumblebee plant list, I can be that specific. Um, you're going to get, you know. There are a lot of things you put in, you'll get tons of impatience, but, but Fervidus and Vagans and Tricola won't touch it. And what's the point then, really? Right. Um, someone asked, what's a good way to get involved if I have a small space and can't personally plant things that are on the list? Right, so, um, so if, if you can't put in, I mean, is the question that you can't put anything in or you're going to get somebody else to put the plants in. I mean, if you have a small space, I would say, and you had to prioritize, spring pollen plants from the list should go in first because that's what's really missing. And in, in most of the traditional pollinator habitats that I see, things don't come into bloom, bloom until June. And that's well beyond when these species actually need it. So shifting to the shrubs, I'm trying to collect more data on trees, which are important in the spring. Um, but certainly I have enough there to get like with the willow alone, four species of consecutively booming willow, male and female should help out um, in the spring. So I would say to shift there first, then early summer. And then the last thing we need is more fall plants. There's enough goldenrod and aster floating around. Um, it's when you should front load if you have to prioritize. Excellent. Um, there's also a question about how much does species at risk extend beyond Massachusetts regionally? For example, New England, New York, how much overlap? East, Eastern North America. All the species that are in trouble here are in trouble throughout their native range. Um, there are also other species in trouble, but they, their range doesn't extend into Massachusetts, but, but it's, it's not a Massachusetts problem. It's a Eastern North America problem and Western North America and global, but the species on my list are Eastern North America. Or Eastern, yeah. I, I would include Aphanus, and I know enough about Aphanus. We don't have it any longer, but I looked at some of what's going on in uh, Minnesota. And, and again, if they're not using data to generate those lists, which concerns me, um, they'd be more in line with what Trickle is doing. Yeah. Um, Gary was just wanted you to just clearly reiterate which of the species are at, at risk, just so we all are very clear on which one. Well, in terms of the bumblebees, it's the long-tongue bumblebees, Bombus fervidus, Bombus vagans, and Bombus tericola are the three that are in decline based on published studies and based on my own work in Massachusetts. And Canada um, for that. Right. And then there's a question, are there any specific, meaning particularly disruptive, uh, non-natives that we should think about removing? Well, so let me say about non-natives. So the veteran red clover is really what's keeping these species alive, you know, or keeping them from becoming locally extinct, I should say. So we don't want to go in and mow it. We, what we want to do is introduce the natives. Once we get the native populations up, then we can phase out the, the non-natives. But, but invasive non-natives are you know, this idea that, that because it's a rose, multiflora rose is good because they're using it for pollen is absolutely false. Roses aren't the same. Um, you know, we see them in the fall on a, a bunch of, a, a lot of activity on non-natives and invasives in the fall. And it's all common species that, or honeybees that don't really need any help. Um, so I would say that, you know, most, a, a lot of the the invasives are, are covering up or choking out the natives. And so by removing those, I think you, that would have the most benefit based on the loose strife data that I showed you. Yep. Yeah, they're, they're uh, choking out biodiversity. <laughs> um, yes, yeah. So there, I, I don't know, um, I feel like this might be, uh, well, let's see, do, do you have an opinion about the use of glyphosate to remove invasive non-native plants on conservation? Right, yeah, good question. Um, 
so yes, I, I think there's, so it depends on what we're talking about. So I think ecologically speaking, there can be some negative effects and, and looking from the perspective of native plants, um, using it to get rid of loose strife, um, I've seen the benefits from that perspective. That said, I would try everything else before I would try using any sort of chemical treatment. So, you know, I was speaking with uh, a few groups that used the, the beetle to remove loose strife and it was very effective in their case. And I would say, you know, pulling, it depends on how, how bad your invasive issue, how much of an invasive issue you have. Um, so, you know, I would say to avoid it if you can. Sorry, so there was a request to stop screen sharing. So I oh, sorry. <laughs> I didn't know if I, you could see me. I didn't right. even notice. <laughs> <laughs> um, earlier, I, I wanted to get those plant, make sure I got those plant questions in. And I think we'll probably just go through a couple more questions and then um, we will say good night. But I know that there are, are some other questions in the chat about resources and I will get to those later and make sure that in my follow-up email to all registrants that the resources are um, that you're asking for are distributed. So there was a question about iNaturalist and exactly how data is sort of being extracted from it and how data is going into it. So do so, folks have to use the application or? No. So what we're doing is we're using iNaturalist API, which means we're taking the ID feature of iNaturalist and we're incorporating it into our own app. So we are not transferring data to iNaturalist and we're not taking data from iNaturalist. We're, we're using their, their uh, computational tools to help us to expand our project. And so I'm, you know, I've teamed up, I, I didn't mention this with um, two faculty from Worcester Polytechnic Institute that we have a team of computer science students and faculty that are working on the app. And so that's the way the app's going to be used. I would be surprised because iNaturalist is just IDing species. It's not looking at interactions, which is what we're looking at, that they may be incorporating some of what we're doing into their iNaturalist app proper, but we're not transferring data to, to and from iNaturalist. Excellent. Uh, oh, and Chris is asking, Oh, just said observation fields are used for interactions. It is yeah. one comment. That was um, that's something that I use in iNaturalist to document flower visitors. So there are observations fields that give you that metadata, and then that feeds into um, uh, one of the other databases. That's why I was asking that question because there is particular fields that I use in iNaturalist, and I I'm hoping that that helps you, even though I'm not, I'm not looking in Massachusetts, I'm somewhere else, but that's why I was asking that question is, yeah, as so, a user, what field should we be using? Right, so, so good question, yeah. So, so we will be doing things separately and it will, be more, it will be very clear what we're looking at because I'm interested in the behavior. And so for what we're doing, we're taking short 10 second video clips and then going frame by frame to extract information so that we can get the behavior that the, the bee or the butterfly is, is performing. Um, during its interaction, um, but I can get access to the iNaturalist data because I believe it's public and I can pull all those data if it's in the database, if, if you do have a uh, flower observation and take a look at those data and incorporate them into our database. Um, I have done it to some extent with species level data. I haven't, I don't know if I can do it with observations or not, but um, I won't be pulled, we can't pull because of privacy, we can't pull stuff from iNaturalist um, database. Interesting. Did I answer your question, Chris? Okay, great. Um, a question I th that I actually had was just, um, or maybe a point of clarification. We were talking about how, you mentioned how a, a small sort of percentage of um, bees or pollinator species are actually pollinating crops, right? And a lot of, you know, yep. especially, you know, in the big uh, industrial agriculture, we're talking about mostly honeybees and sometimes commercial bumblebees. Um, but I just wanted to, for a point of clarification for New England, you know, we have much smaller scale agriculture. Um, so is it your sense that, you know, the, the wild bees that are here um, are in fact providing those crop pollination services and people don't necessarily need to be using honeybees in this context. Well, right, so, so 
so yes, that certainly that that if you have a smaller operation, and it depends on the crop plant. Um, and depends on whether you use pesticides and things as well. But, but um, still, if you look at the number of species, those that are actually doing the pollinating is still very small. It, it doesn't, the, the numbers, so the number of species is different than how many of a particular species are, are doing the pollinating. So to answer your question, yes, I do think that wild bees could do the pollinating that you need for crop plants in a, on a smaller scale operation. Um, that's, that's not what I'm, I'm saying. So they, you could swap out the honeybee for, and get a system where you would have enough of something to do the pollinating that you need for crop plants. Right. Um, it's just but, but it's still in terms of the number of species, it's still not, it's not like 50, 80% of our native bees are pollinating crop plants that those, I don't, I have yet to see any data from published studies saying that the number was that high. Mm -hmm. 10%, I think, is, is pushing it in terms of native bee species. Uh, just relatedly, someone was asking, are there, you know, crop, vegetable, fruit um, plants that are good for these at-risk pollinators that you know of? Uh, I mean, I think, um, so again, the spring blooming trees, I don't have a ton of data on, but I, I do know that that um, there are some cherry, plum, apple that are pretty good sources of nectar and pollen for queens, um, or they definitely visit them. Now, whether there are straight native species that they would prefer at that time, I don't have enough data to make, to make a comment. So, you know, I'm not saying to stop agriculture. <laughs> um, I'm saying that if you do have agriculture, you could also help biodiversity as well by putting in some of these plants that aren't your typical plants that you would see for, you, you would not plant most of what's on my list for honeybees, for example, because they have a short tongue and they could never get in unless you had a nectar robber that was opening them up, right? So I'm working with um, farms and hope to work with more um, small scale operations, organic farms to try to to balance things in terms of crop pollination and then biodiversity and pollination systems in the ecological side of the equation. So I, I do feel that there, that can be done, um, but that's a work in progress. Excellent. Well, I think uh, it's 8.20, so, um, and I do wanna respect everyone's time. So I think we're probably gonna say good night. I do appreciate you staying on for an extra 20 minutes to oh, answer questions. Thank you for doing that. Um, so thank you everyone. I, I think I got to most questions, but perhaps not all of them. I will go back to the chat. And if there were any um, questions that uh, we didn't answer, I will pull them out and I can send them to Rob and hope to get a couple, a couple more answers, answers that we can send by email. Um, you can certainly you. send out my email. Sorry for cutting you off. You could oh, send no, out my email too to everybody. I'm happy if you want to email me with a question, you know, I'll either answer through email or we could set up a phone conversation or Zoom if needed, if it's a more involved question, but I'm happy to, um, to answer outside of this. So. Excellent, thank you for that offer. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> so thank you everyone for coming out tonight. Um, uh, thank you for coming to our, our last event of the year. If you are new to the Massachusetts Pollinator Network, uh, you can sign up for our email list, which includes uh, a newsletter. Basically, you'll get a newsletter every month, which includes event announcements, which uh, will be about like our seminar series and the monthly meeting that we host. Um, so if you go to masspollinatornetwork.org, uh, you can sign up to get those emails. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful night and have an excellent holiday season. <laughs>